So a few updates on Clifton Market. Uh, we uh, did fix the parking lot. There was an issue. Somebody stole that grill, so we patched that hole up so your car doesn't get damaged. Uh, that's just a temporary fix, so we'll uh, fix it for good here uh, once we get some good bids. And also, uh, to offset some of these higher costs, we are running uh, weekly specials now. And you can sign up for that on the website, and that way you'll get the text or email every week on our uh, some of the deep discounts. So please take advantage of that. Go to our website, Clifton.com, and sign up to get those uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, and uh, as always, thank you for your support to make the Clifton Market a uh, uh, proud of, uh, neighborhood. And uh, we are glad that we're here and this, everything is going well. Um, my name is Fred Ellenberger. This is my piece called Summer Iceberg. Uh, and it's about uh, climate uh, change and uh, global warming. And I would like to say that uh, back in 1992, there was a coalition put together called the uh, global, global Climate Coalition. And this was a, uh, a PR blitz to convince people that uh, global warming was not uh, done by human beings and corporations. So that was the reason why I made this piece. So. Have you been at sea with the iceberg? I have seen icebergs uh, when I was in Alaska. Uh, th the way that this came about was that I was down in Mexico and uh, was fortunate enough to work with um, a woman who had a, a print studio down there. And I, that was my first introduction to printmaking because I'm not a uh, trained artist. But um, so when I got back here to the States, I asked Mark if he could help me. Uh, make some work, and this is the result of that. So, very, very fun. Uh, to work with Mark. Mark. Yes, Mark's Mark's a great guy. No doubt about it. I mean, you can ask anybody. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, you know, he, he's the pillar of printing, along with the, uh, the print club. What's his name? I forget the Anyway. Tiger Lily? Or yes, Tiger Lily. Tiger Lily, yeah. I, I, did, I do see their stuff drift by on the uh, Instagram mm -hmm. because that's how we all communicate anymore. So, Well, this, this is a subtle political piece, if there ever was one. Uh, yes, I, I would say so. Uh, it's not in your face. Right. You know, but... Uh, it, it, it started from a long time ago because I was going to build an iceberg and float it in a lake. And because of COVID and my partners who moved away to Chicago, uh, it just not never got realized. And I still would like to actually do it, uh, but this was a quicker and easier way to get the idea across. So well, I'm sure you're working on now how you can get a blow up iceberg going. Like um, who makes them and where do you buy one? Well, I, I, I tried to do that once with, um, I just didn't have the uh, funds for it because uh, I wanted to fly a, a big piece of um, lemon meringue pie off of my studio that was right by I-75. So I wanted to do pie in the sky. So I did a painting instead. Yes, uh, well, they've made the tremendous advances, you know, with the uh, Thanksgiving parade and the Macy's parade. Those, uh, uh, it's really accessible now. Yes, and it was uh, it was funny because I was I was I was um, looking for a place to help me, and the name of the company was I think it was in San Francisco. It was called Pie in the Sky. <laughs> they said, "Well, we can do anything." I was like, "Okay, well, it was out of my budget." So that's what happened there. But. Yeah, I guess the only budget you'd have is to buy the fabric and sew it yourself. Right, or, or whatever they use. I don't know if, if they use parachute material or, or just how you keep them, uh, keep the air inside the you yes, know, structure. Yes. I think there's a lot of baffles and things like that that you got to 
True, true. Yeah. But getting, get, getting back to this print, uh, it's basically a blue color field, very subtle. How, how difficult is it to achieve that on the plate? Uh, it, was, it takes some doing. It's very saturated. Much more saturated than, than most prints you see. And so it took us a while to get to that. Uh, and I just made the plate, you know, the copper plate, and we did the, we did the fade, what I call the fade, I think they call it something else, but, uh, and then we ran that on the top, on top of it, so. And it's subtle enough for me, because I'm very much a minimalist in my aesthetic, so it's, uh, it turned, you know, I thought it was pretty, yeah, pretty, 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 fun, pretty fun. successful. Yeah, they won't, they're, they're after you. That's good. That's what, no worries. It's insidious. I'm sorry. I just have to turn it off here for a second. But I, I enjoyed working with Mark and uh, having some fun. And hopefully I'll be able to return uh, to do some more things. Uh, how many uh, was in the addition? Uh, there's two of those, and then there are uh, about 10 other images that we did. We kind of worked our way towards this. This was the most, I guess, the most difficult to get it nice and smooth. And this, this, it, it, the, getting them saturated like that is, is yeah. that's a lot of ink on there. So. And what was the, what was the color? It wasn't theophiling, it was... Uh, I'm not sure what that was. I might have made a mix of two blues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't remember. Uh, there's a, there is an indigo. I don't know if that was, if that mm -hmm. was it uh, that, or not. I'm not, I'm really kind of a 3D person, you know, so I, I'm not familiar with all the colors. Well, 3D, then you're, you produce 3D art mostly? I'm, I'm, I'm more of an installation artist and, and a sculptor. So this is, like I was saying, this was the first time I ever really got into doing any uh, prints. Well, great. It's a great honor that Mark thought that your print was going to be the one selected for his Well, I, 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 I appreciate it, you know, and uh, I, there, were, there were two up for grabs, and I'm glad we used this one. The other one is a much more, oh, maybe it's my phone. <laughs> it could be. Who cares? It sounds good coming from you. Bing. It doesn't sound good coming from you. Well, so, so anyway, I mean, uh, they're, they're both very different. And um, um, the well, other, you can check your phone. We'll edit all this out. The, the, the other one is more uh, uh, kind of tropical. So it's, but this is more. Uh, serious. So check your phone. Yeah, I'll take a better look at it here. I want to talk about your 3D work. Well, I did a nice piece down at the, uh, I always refer to it as the Aronoff Center because that's where I, I installed it. But um, yes. it was actually through Dennis Harrington at yes. the Western. Yes. So I, uh, there's a matrix of windows that, um, or, uh, you know, it's that Cesar Pelli designed architect. Uh, and um, I colored the windows with some translucent color. This is about 10 years ago? Oh, probably 15, 20, 20, 20 years ago. Yeah, I remember that. Like, do, you, do you? Yeah, yeah. I did that. And, you know, just various things, you know. I, I kind of jump around a lot. Nobody ever told me I couldn't, so. Well, uh, what are you working on now? That's the important thing. Uh, getting my back. Oh, gosh. That's a personal <laughs> but, sculpture piece. Right, right. That's unfortunately. But, uh, I mean, I still noodle around, and I actually am getting some stuff of Bill uh, Ranchler's uh, framing up some of my stuff. I did, I did some pieces down in Mexico, just of sea and sky which I really love, and I, I'm having one of those. But then I got into um, making uh, collage out of uh, wine caps, 
you know, the tops from the wine. And uh, I would cut those up and make various things. So I could probably have a show with those too at some point. But well, That's a lot of drinking, isn't it? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I get them from... Um, <laughs> I, I get them from Market Wines, oh, uh, Mike, down at Market oh, Wines. Oh, yes. yes. So, so he, he helped me. <laughs> Although I, I was living in a place where a lot of wine was getting consumed, and that's, that's how I started doing it, actually. It wasn't really all my doing, but um, they ended, you know, there, there were a lot of uh, dinner parties and things like that that kind of got me started. I said, you know, I like these. They're very malleable, and they're, you know, they're kind of interesting colors. So, and they're small. I, I just put them on eight and a half by 11 paper and uh, do that. So. so, these are the caps itself, the wine cap, uh, the screw cap for a wine. Bottle. Well, the, the, the uh, covering up on the top of the bottle. Uh, what if it's a lead cover? It's, a, it's, it's, yes, I don't think they're lead. There's something like that. But, they're, but they, I, they used to be. Yeah, they used just to be. like they used to have corks. Right. <laughs> now they're rubber. I see. Or, or some kind of, you know, other type of uh, material. So, uh, and you can make some small pieces. And then I was doing uh, probably my favorites. Well, maybe not my favorites, but uh, some, of the, some of the pieces that I really liked were uh, grids. It's these beautiful grids of uh, various colors or or actually just one color. I did a silver one and a gold one and uh, did some others too. So, and then they're somewhat abstract. But uh, I did have a, I did have a, uh, uh, an art teacher once that said, you know, I like your work because no one told you what you couldn't do. <laughs> and I always, I always kind of ran with that. So I, try to always think about things in, a, in that kind of way, really. so not much on a variation of a theme, so to speak, I guess, but uh, which is all right. I mean, I don't think that's bad. No, no, it makes you a darling of the art world. Uh, I don't know. Well, thank you. I, you know, it's a, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I, I look around, there's no <laughs> thing like that, but you know, so. Well, that, that uh, just going like, back to the iceberg, it seems like it's floating in water, underwater. Right, right. Well, I, you know, I just kind of floated it in there. And uh, it doesn't necessarily have the horizon line, although it does fade up. So you do get a little bit of that, but not a whole lot. It was, you know, it's more just kind of there. Is on paper, so I was to focus on the iceberg itself. So, but um, there, there, you know, I, I used that as the as the the vehicle to make my point. So, and they're somewhat austere, and maybe somebody will look at it and wonder why it's like that. And if they if they did, I could explain to them, you know, what what that's all about. Because uh, well, you don't need to explain it. The art speaks for itself. Well, yes, I, and the climate, the whole climate thing. You know, it's it's. I mean, the weather here in Cincinnati's changed. You know, I grew up here. I left for a long time and came back. I lived out in California for about ten years, and that's you know, it's kind of where I got started making art. And then I came back here and got married and had a kid and all that stuff. So, but now I'm just trying to get focused again. Once I get through this, yes, you. I hope you come back uh, strong and uh, and can complete those pieces you, you spoke about. Yeah, well, I I uh, I want to I want to make the uh, you know I had another company that was making called Magnetic Panel System and. Uh, it's, they have a, a honeycomb backing behind the panel and they're white, they're uh, plastic and they have a veil on them. And they're for a four by eight sheet, 
it weighs about 10 pounds. So we were going to, I, I, my background's in film production and you know, I was a set builder and I was working with a guy named Tom Paul who was a designer. And uh, so we worked together to make this, we have it all made and we can scale it down or scale it up. I was going to make it very large, but I'm going to try to bring it down now and use that white uh, stuff and float it in there and, and uh, take some photos with a drone and stuff like that and just make make our point with that. Yes. So, yeah, we, I, I, it's a, uh, you know, the main thing we were talking about was I said, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be like a cork bouncing around in the lake, you know, so we kind of slanted it into the water to make it look more realistic. And uh, I think we did a good job. And then there's a hole in it, like a cave, and you could see through to maybe see a little bit of landscape to kind of place it visually in the context of the, the surrounds. So that's sort of where we're going with that. Well, I can't wait to see it. I can hardly imagine it. I'm getting my head around it. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's kind of complicated, and that's why I never got started because uh, we, you know, I wanted to dedicate, you know, things kind of just fell apart. So I said, well, maybe we'll do it. And this was the answer for right now, I guess. I don't know that's what that is. But it's, uh, it's always a... It's always a journey and it's always fun, you know, to do stuff like that. So uh, it seems like it's what I like to do. <laughs> so. well, well, thank you very much for your interview. And, uh, oh, well, th it's nice to meet you. Tom Laurie and you're Tom Laurie, Fred Ellenberg. Okay, Ellenberg. Yeah, yeah. 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 my dad was, uh, he worked for Procter & Gamble for many years. So what, in we advertising? Were, uh, no, uh, he was uh, building soap factories, so oh. I was uh, very lucky to live all around the world growing up. I was oh. born in Brussels, Belgium, and lived in South America and Germany and England and all kinds of places. So. That's the way to grow up. Yeah, it's, it's different, that's for sure. <laughs> so, but, I, I get, maybe that has something to do with what I'm doing now. I don't know, but uh, oh, it does. I, I suppose it's just in me. So, but well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, no, yeah. pleasure. pleasure. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Rich. Introduce yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I'm Rich Bidding, and my piece here is Kepler's Harmony. It's a uh, intaglio print done by Mark Patsfold, of course. And it's a, it's a musical score. Uh, it's based on a motet that I had written. It's a piece for voices, uh, six voices. And uh, it's a recording uh, that was released on my uh, Nine Summer Haiku CD. I think it was the first CD I put together, so. Well, you've had a history of uh, producing uh, um, ambient sound mm -hmm. recordings and combining it with the uh, artwork. That yeah, uh, it all goes back to probably 1969. I was working on probably the third or fourth Moog synthesizer that uh, came out at Westchester State College. And I was doing demonstrations on it. One of my professors uh, said, hey, would you like to take composition lessons? I'm taking lessons from this really cool guy named George Crumb. Well, George had won the Pulitzer Prize in 1968, and I was a private student for uh, a short while, a little over a year, I went to his house and uh, he does graphic scores. He's famous for that kind of thing and that kind of got me going in that direction. Moving on to UC, I went to CCM, came out here and I was taking a graduate colloquium in the arts called John Cage and New York in the 50s. It was taught by Joe Face and Foster Wigan. And I met a whole bunch of artists. And I think I was probably one of the few, if not the only uh, musician there. And um, we got to know each other. And Mark Patsfall came up to me one day and said, hey, I like this, because uh, I did a black line blueprint of a piece called Music for Central Bridge. 
And Mark said, wow, that would make a great intaglio print. I said, well, I don't know how to do that. He said, but I do. And that's what started it. So he printed that and we started selling those. And then I started hiring people to do the performances. And so that's kind of how that thing got rolling. So, and uh, what is an intaglio print? It's a, an etching. So yeah, it's, it's etched plate. in the surface. It's a, well, or a copper or this, I guess a zinc plate. zinc plate. Yeah, and it's etched into the surface and the, the ink is in the surface. Paper's dampened and put under pressure where the ink then comes out on the paper. I'm not a printmaker, so <laughs> that's my simple understanding of the process. But it's very difficult because when you put the ink on it and put the ink in the surface, and then you have to wipe the plate clean. It takes a certain skill, and Mark was exceptionally good at that kind of thing. He had a good eye, good color eye, you know, good design mm -hmm. sense. So, well, this uh, piece looks uh, almost uh, like a score, but also like a solar system. Uh, it's got everything to it. Well, yeah, Kepler, Johannes Kepler was, a, if I'm not mistaken, an 18th century astronomer. And with a naked eye, he discovered the uh, uh, circular, actually the elliptical pattern orbit of Mars. And he worked for Taco Bray, or Taco Bray, if right. you pronounce right. it. And Tycho uh, had a specific island that was given to him by the Danish government. It was called uh, Uraniborg. And Tycho was a very unique character. He had lost his nose in a duel, so he had a silver nose replaced. I mean, we're talking about some very unique <laughs> individuals. So anyhow, uh, Kepler had written something called Music of the Spheres, where he figured out that um, planetary motion, there was a divine proportion. And he actually wrote some pitches for each uh, sphere, each planet of the then known, there are six of them. And I use those pitches as a starting point for the writing of the motet. So that's why it looks kind of like a, maybe a star chart or a, you know, something like that. And what was the addition of this? 15, I believe, with maybe a couple artist proofs. Yeah, it was a, a really a tough thing to print. So Mark did a fantastic job on it. Yeah. Well, uh... It seems like every one of your pieces always combines the music with the piece of art. Well, kind of. It's, it kind of fulfills me. Now I do a lot of photography. Um, uh, I just finished, actually, uh, doing a, a soundtrack for a friend of mine, Michael Scott. And yes. Michael, yeah, Michael has a show called Preternatural. It's at the Cincinnati Museum Center. And Michael commissioned me to write a soundtrack. And it's just right down my alley. And looking at his pieces are fantastic. He has 33 pieces filling up about 5,000 square feet. And the walls are dark, paintings are lit, and some of them are 18 feet wide. They're immense. And this is a life's work. And it's wonderful, wonderful work. If you get a chance, you ought to go here. It's at the museum center. Yeah, right now. I'll be there till till uh, June, excuse me, January 6th. So January 6th. And yeah. it, it encompasses like a, a long period of this. Yeah. It's a track record of this. Yeah, you can actually go and sit and look at the work and listen to the sound. I have a lot of, one of my practices, I started way back uh, when I started doing this. I started doing what's called field recording. So I had needed the sound of the stream, so I record a stream or, you know, I started recording um, soundscapes, different types of soundscapes. In fact, I just had a piece. Um, I was visiting uh, uh, Yellowstone with my wife in early June, and it was before it flooded. We went back Slough Creek Road, which is in the Lamar Valley. And, you know, we saw tons of buffaloes. I didn't see any wolves. I didn't see any elk back there. I saw pronghorns and uh, but anyhow, I'm just, I'm, I walked down to, uh, with my earphones and my recorder, down to a, a, a little pond. It was, a, it was a, a, a vernal pond, which only has water in the spring. And sure enough, I heard the croaking of a frog and a couple of them. So I recorded it. It's a boreal chorus frog, the only frog found there. <laughs> so I put that together with a piece when I got home and uh, 
I was picked up by a recording company in Spain, and they did a, uh, a compilation for World Soundscape Day, which was last Monday, I believe. So that's online, which was pretty cool. That was fun. It was a neat piece to work on. So I had the, the frog. And I, I compose other sounds to go with it, kind of a, a kind of like a my own nature film. <laughs> well, you, you've got to have a fantastic ear. Do you, well, know, do you know what key those frogs are singing? Well, in? nothing is in equal temper. Everything we know is not in divine harmony. Back in, I believe it was, uh, in Bach's time, when he wrote the, the 12, 24 Preludes and Pudes of the Well-Tempered Clavier, it was a, basically that was a, uh, a, an advertisement for equal temperament. Uh, so what they did, they kind of squashed the octave and squashed everything so you could play in different keys and modulate. Well, before that time, you, if you're going to play something in, you're, it's in C major and you want to play something in B flat major, you had to retune the harpsichord, you know, because it wasn't, it wasn't in tune because of something called the Pythagorean column. But we can get into that later. But if you take a, take a, a string and you put it in half, you get an octave. And then you, you know, an octave and an octave and then four thirds, you get a fifth or a fourth and so on and so forth. Well, if you keep extrapolating those frequencies around, they don't meet up. There's a difference. So that's natural sound. So everything we've listened to that we think is so wonderful is actually out of tune with <laughs> nature. <laughs> wow. If you listen to a, a, a really good uh, vocal group singing together, you notice how it seems to ring. Well, they're not singing in equal temperament. They're singing in open, there's open fifths, open thirds, open octaves. Everything really rings. It's really beautiful. And they do that deliberately because yeah. it sounds good. Yeah, and they have good hearing. And <laughs> yes, they, yes, that's a, something that's eluded me. Well, it's a practice. You know, it's just like, you know, if I sat down and tried to paint, uh, which I have done, you know, it's frustrating to me because I don't have the, I haven't practiced. I don't have the skill to sit and, I know what I'd like to do, but I don't have the skill to do it. So I've been doing photography and turning photography into work. So how did you uh, generate the uh, soundtrack for uh, Michael Scott's show? I have a, a computer studio, uh, it's a Mac based studio, and I have a lot of sound samples that I put together. So I can put natural sounds with something called MIDI musical instrument digital interface, or I can play synthesized sounds. And I can also, uh, I can buy samples of, for example, violins playing uh, Sul Tosca or Sul Ponticello on the bridge, different t techniques. So I can get different sounds, different attacks, plucks, all kinds of on, on strings. Um, some of the, you know, some of the horn sounds are wanky. I don't like them, but you know, there's, there's things you can do that. So you can put your whole orchestra together that way if you want, or I can put sounds together that aren't related to natural instruments. So if I hear something in the environment that I really like, and it's kind of flute-like, but it's not a flute, I can pick a, you know, a sine tone and add some things to it until I get something that will go with it. So. Well, it's almost like you're a master Foley artist. Yeah, there we go. Foley is a lot of having to do with it. Uh, back in the day, Foley is, is where, you know, someone's walking across the floor and there's Foley artists that imitate that and record it. And you can actually buy those things now, but I, I don't, I do all my own samples, and, mm -hmm. except for the, uh, the, the, you know, the orchestral pieces, uh, that kind of thing. So, and it's great because you get a lot of practice that way. So, and I tend to be, put things very quietly uh, in the background because when you're out listening to ambient sounds, it doesn't overwhelm you. And you might hear something in the distance, you know, I hear something behind you, you know, sound is a fascinating thing. It's, um, if I can remember that visuals take a quarter of a second. When you see something, it takes a quarter of a second to hit your cortex, your brain. A sound does it in nine hundredths of a second. So because our ancestors were good at listening, that's why we're alive today. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, you think about that. Uh, sound is a really primary uh, sense. Uh, and we live in a really loud environment. And part of the problem is there's too much information. So instead of paying attention to all the sound, we ignore it. So we block it out mentally. Uh, we don't pay attention. There's some beautiful sounds in the city, but we've learned to block it out. The last five, six years I've been doing sound walks in Cincinnati, where it's a practice where you walk quietly, listen to the environment, and I give people certain prompts of how to listen, what to listen for. Um, you know, if you think you're listening, you're not listening, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and as we're listening, other things are listening to us. So it's a reciprocity, a reciprocal thing. You know, it, it really, uh, really makes a difference. <laughs> it made me think of something I thought yeah. of the other day uh, to uh, see. Why, why do we allow dogs to bark at night? <laughs> if somebody started going outside and yelling in the middle of the night, yeah. it would be unacceptable. Well, I have neighbors that have some yappy dogs. And they're really high and obnoxious. And luckily, they don't bark all night. But in the late afternoons, and they're out, they want to come in, and they just never give up. And I was thinking about recording them and playing them back outside at night. That I thought, nah, you know, that's not being a good neighbor. But, you know, uh, whatever. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's certain very obnoxious sounds. Like in my neighborhood, I live up in Finneytown. And uh, <laughs> I joke, I live next to the... Uh, uh, West North Bend uh, Motorcycle Speedway. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, there's a sound. You can hear really high running motorcycles. All the two cycles, yeah. Oh, it's amazing. It, you know, that's fine, a certain amount of it. But after a while, it gets old. <laughs> Just like me. <laughs> I live on the, uh, uh, the downward leg of Plains Landing at CBG. Oh, yeah. And, I hear that, too. Uh, I listen to the engines at night. And yeah. I, I spoke to an engine specialist. Mm -hmm. And I said, you could probably tell what engine it is. Yeah, I'm sure. To they you said, probably yes. Yeah. Over my house, uh, I live up where that tall TV tower is. And a lot of times they use that as a turning point. Yes. And they'll put down the landing gear. And yes. I, hear them, I can hear the yes. different types of landing gear come down. I can hear <laughs> train whistles in the distance, which is wonderful. And then down here in Clifton, there's a, um, down in the, the valley, there's a, a switching yard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a high pitch squeal from the trains that are being shunted in different tracks. It's so amazing. At Camp Washington, you can really hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to somebody and said, it's really getting on my nerves. <laughs> but when you're farther away and occasionally you hear it, you go, wow, that's so nice. <laughs> yes, and occasionally you can hear the, yeah. uh, the steamboats. On the river. Yeah. Yeah, the low uh, horns. Uh, the, what's it called? The Delta Queen comes to town. True. True. The Calafi, the steam. Yeah, the Calafi. Yeah. But you can actually hear the engines of the tow boats. Oh, yeah. Through the, past the rail yard. But that's that envelope mm -hmm. we have sort of about it. I did a recording a number of years ago down at Sailor Park. Um, there was ice on the river and there was a, a, uh, marker buoy that was being hit by ice. And so I was recording that and I had some underwater microphones I put in the water. And my God, the sound of the thrum of the diesel engines from, you could hear it miles away. It's incredible. So that low thrumming sound and then the crunching of the ice and the, you know, the resonance of the boat with marker buoy, it was a pretty interesting sound. <laughs> There's a lot of neat sounds out there. That, I know, and you've been able to encapsulate so many of them into, yeah. you know, concise performances. Well, yeah, you kind of, I, I've been doing very quiet things lately. Uh, uh, my newest CD will be out in September called A Thin Distant Sound, and I have about three 18-minute pieces in there. And, you know, one of them is, is based on... Um, just a really quiet, I took a photo. In fact, I had a photograph of um, in the Badlands I took as it was getting dark. And there was a car on the canyon in the distance, just leaving a, a tiny little trail of dust, like white dust that was lit up by the rays of the evening sun. 
And you could hear that car just barely in the distance. That's how quiet it was. Around here, you might have seen that, but you wouldn't have been able to hear it because it would have been masked by, you know, buses and other sounds. But out there, you can hear for miles because it's so quiet. And so that got me thinking. So it's a very quiet, I do a lot of quiet pieces lately to listen at very low levels, kind of, uh, they're ambient sounds. So you're, you're, how's your hearing going in this day? Well, it's screwed up like anybody's <laughs> my age. But, uh, I have crickets constantly because of, you know, loud sounds back in the day, but I have pretty good hearing. I have some holes in my hearing, like, uh, one of them, I can't remember, 5,000 hertz, I guess, somewhere around there, 1,600 hertz. Um, and sometimes when I mix, I'll make high-pitched things a little louder than they need to be. So I need a younger set of ears to listen right. and say, hey, exactly. that's, a, that's a little loud. Because everything is just, you know, did you ever, um, a good friend of mine back in college was a piano tuner. And... I was always amazed at how, I said, how do you tune the piano? Well, you know, they have three, four, two, sometimes just one, but the higher ones have maybe four, maybe five strings, and they're not in tune with each other. If they were, they would cancel each other out. So they're slightly off. So when she tuned them, she would dampen certain ones and count the beats. You could hear the... And that's how she did it. Now people can use an oscillator and see and make sure it's visually, but she did it by ear. And it really fascinating because you can really hear that. It's, it's really fascinating. It's all in what you pay attention to. I always tell a story. A good friend of mine, John Talmadge, um, tells a story. Um, an indigenous man and another person were walking down the street in Brooklyn and the indigenous man stopped and he said, wow, listen to that cricket. And the other guy looked at him and said, how the hell can you hear a cricket and all this noise? And the indigenous guy smiled and reached in his pocket, took out a quarter and dropped it on the ground. And four people turned around. <laughs> he said, it's all what you listen for. <laughs> and that's true. It's all what you listen for. When you're playing your guitar, are you listening to the trucks or the traffic, you're listening to the pitches of the guitar. I mean, it's the same thing. To, you focus on what you're working on. You're right. Yeah. Uh, at night, uh, sometimes when I'm laying awake, I will, uh, I will try to focus on listening to the ambient sound yeah. and combine that with uh, listening to the heartbeat and breathing. Yes. And sort of like distraction yeah. from uh, you know, doing analytical data. Of the <laughs> yeah. So your mind, shut up. <laughs> but, uh, I wanted to mention a movie, a Memoria. You might have heard of it. Uh, no. It was a, uh, produced by uh, the uh, Colombian government. It was done in Medellin. Hmm. And uh, the, the producer was a, a, a famous actress, Stan. Jonah Spencer. Anyway, it was a movie about something. And it started out with her visit. It was sort of like she went to uh, Medellin to make this movie. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a script. They just did whatever they did. Mm -hmm. So they went to the local Juilliard in Medellin. And, and some guy was working as a Foley artist. And so she decided that they would use a, a, a pounding sound in repetition in this movie. And she described the sound, and the guy tried to imit imitate it in, as a Foley artist. Oh, that's wonderful. What kind yeah. of a pound was that? And, and yeah. so anyway, they did that, and then eventually we found out what that sound was all about. But it was a very quiet film, mm -hmm. and to me, it was all about the sound. Yeah, it's keeping the you know it's a you know a light motif uh, is a something that Wagner used when he put in certain melodies that he would bring back for certain characters. But it's the same idea. You have a light motif. David Lynch, especially in his first film, Eraserhead, mm -hmm. when he had the sound of the steam radiator, that occurred throughout the piece. And that was like a light motif that brought everything back. Uh, very uh, other movie. I just have uh, been screening Mulholland and Drive. Oh, really? That's an amazing movie. And uh, all the sound is important. Yeah, it's very important.
And, you know, if we listen to everything, it would drive us crazy. But, and I should say, if we listen more, we would realize how noisy our environment is. And it doesn't need to be as noisy as it is. Um, there are certain things that are silly that, you know, why is that making a noise? It doesn't have to make a noise, especially automobiles. The way you mean like your phone beeping instruments? Yeah, or, or the like tires, that. for example, on an automobile. All oh, right, tires. The electric cars now, that's the loudest sound from the car is the damn tire. And they're making new tires that don't make that roar. Um, I did a recording of the interstate and the different size wheels and tires and speeds create different pitch bands starting, you know, very quietly and getting louder and going away. It was, it was, you could filter that. It, quite beautiful after a while if you're at a distance but we well, mentioned you know. earlier about me listening to jet engines yeah they, they're really working very hard to make them oh, yeah. so that, that makes when they fly over each engine has like a special yeah. melody oh well, it does i i had a customer once um I worked for a while managing a bicycle shop and I managed one in Northern Kentucky and a fellow walked in and we were talking and he was a train engineer and he used to bring a train through Kentucky and into Cincinnati across the bridge. So we were talking and I, I said, what is it with train horns? They, they all sound different. And he said, that's because we tune them differently. He said, different engineers, we will mess with it to give it a certain sound so we know who's you know, what train it is cool. and i thought you know that's from a long time ago now it's all digital and they can you know gps where everything is but that's a, a carryover from that day uh, it's fascinating stuff you know? yes it's uh which uh, brings up another question i have for you the blues is a sound mm -hmm. and uh I mean, you, you can say it's kind of based on ancient uh, field songs or mm -hmm. songs of workers, but is it is it uh, have a human component or is it all derived from uh, uh, what should you say? Is it just the standard way to make a song at that period of time? Well, it was basically from the feeling and working and you know the da -da -da -da. You know, kind of taking that third and flattening it. It gave them a feeling of, you know, uh, it felt, they, they felt it viscerally with their body. A struggle. Yeah, a struggle. So, yes. and they're all related to a lot of uh, uh, African Americans when they came to this country, they had nothing. And blues a lot of times had um, kind of a lot of hidden meanings. So they would sing work songs, but they had a hidden meaning. So they knew, yeah, the promised land was north of the Ohio River or in the Jordan River. What was the Ohio River? Or, you know, those kind of things. It's a very, yeah, that's, that's a, whole, a whole history. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, wonderful we, stuff. Well, we could go on and on, Rich. But we uh, could. <laughs> uh, we might as well cut it short. Thanks for stopping yeah. by. Uh, Lovely to see your piece. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, welcome. Who is that, Steve? How are you? Wow, fantastic. All the way from up north.
Who was that by? Me. Oh my God. <laughs> That's just That's great. What I, what I was Leo Kaki. One of those things I had. That's one of Eric's favorite. Makeup. It is actually, yeah. Uh, we just saw him up at the garage. I, I just, I forget. I Almost could be. Leo played one meatball. I just, really, it was like a few years ago. I almost couldn't even believe he was playing. He was, he was amazing. He played up at the garage uh, last year. And Michelle and I saw him. And that was the second time I saw him. was before in, uh, at the Ark. Ann Arbor, which is a very famous venue for a lot of artists who played there. And that was probably 20 years ago. It's a song there. Uh, he was incredible. He was really, really impressive. Uh, still very, like, very capable guitar player. Uh, and uh, man, he's definitely, I don't know how old he is. He's a very old guy. He's definitely. Well, you know, it's hard to tell. <laughs> Somewhere between like 70 or 65 and 90, somewhere in that range. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe I'm hoping to enjoy my 70s. <laughs> but I look good. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to become a flight inspector for July. Teach people how they can fly by. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Well, imagine trying to be uh, like an Apollo astronaut. Is no, I, 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 I never taught sports. This is a physical sport. I never taught sports. I taught football. Right, right. And green building technology. So now I'm teaching somebody to do something. You know, yeah, yeah. Actually move, move, move things. Yeah. And, that's, that is and, and it's, I, I, yeah, and I'm not that much. Fun. So we'll see. Are you about any age? You're saying the way no? No, I'm twenty percent according to my mentor. But I'm starting. At least I I know where I am. Well, you passed the major FAA test. I passed all the tests, but that's not the. So before I forget, did. Does, is this like replayable at all or no? This is yeah, it'll be uh, on YouTube. Okay. I need the uh, link. Yes, I will send it off to my friends and family. Yeah. yeah. And then you might get a, who knows, maybe you get a few more followers. Sure. It's a, it'll be on the. <laughs> I'm sorry, I said something while you were playing. <laughs> oh, don't, don't worry. worry. Don't worry, I'll edit that out. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice acoustics in here. It's probably recorded. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the room is great. It's just the wrong thin nature of the room, but it sounds good. Well, it's all hard surfaces, so it makes for a nice, as long as there's nobody else in here, it makes for a nice sound. Uh, and that's what the Stones did. They, they recorded some stuff in a basement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was the uh, exiles on Main Street in a castle. Uh, that basically went around and found out where to place the microphones. You know, it was just a big space. And yeah, just worked at it. Charlie Watts discovered that this is the place for the drums to go. All right, well, it's been a pleasure, Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah, Thanks, pleasure. Uh, I saw it. I said it. Cool. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. Take care. I did. I got a, a couple of the half of us. They make a good half of us. That's it. Very good. So many great local air companies. There's really a lot. So I tell people all the time we're living in the greatest age of beer ever because we know all the science and we've gotten rid of all the, you know, uh, government regulations that stop small companies from making beer. Is that what the it's, it's part of? It's oh part yeah, of yeah. The, the explosion was the eliminating of all the prohibition laws that put in place. Not to prohibit the sale, but after prohibition when they uh, opened up uh, out, uh, manufacturing and selling alcohol again, the the companies that were left colluded with the government 
I mean, basically created laws. No kidding. That's why we had button packs for the three tiered and seventy. The three tiered system was supposed to protect you. So you had makers, distributors, and retail centers. And the idea was um, those by dividing it that way there would be more competition and you would be safer. Now, I don't know if anyone has died from drinking beer, but apparently there was a thought that that was a... That no was kidding. A, I didn't realize that legislative restrictions huge the players up until the... To the up until about 2000. And yeah, in yeah. 1990, 2000, uh, those restrictions started getting lifted. Um, on so, regulating yeah, stuff. So, like in the old days, if you made beer, you couldn't sell it directly. Um, if you distributed beer, you weren't allowed to make it or be a bar. And what was interesting was somehow, even though all those rules were in place, like the Anheuser Busch Company was able to have manufacturing and own the distributorship because it was a different company. It would only carry their beer. So basically, they only carry their beer. So they, by locking up the making and distributing, that's how they control the market. And that went on for years. It was incredibly corrupt. And uh, and yeah, that's all gone. So now you can you, you own a maker's license, you're allowed to sell to the public directly on the premises. You make it, you can sell it right there. And nobody can stop it. And that, that was one of the big chinks in the armor. Well, I must say, Brian Dice has done a good job yeah. of, of leveraging all the advantages of creating truth. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing that's amazing is just how much uh, people are now employed by these small beer companies. Yeah, I love it. I mean, there right, so there's lots of jobs. Wherever I go in the world, I'm looking for brewery. Yeah. At least in the U.S. They're everywhere. Lots of jobs that uh, in the old days couldn't exist because you could only you only had big burgers, and, and they, they were isolated from the public. I've toured them and photographed them, you know, Miller and Trent for a while. Yeah. It's an incredibly large brewery. Yeah. And but I, have to, I, I, I think having a hundred small breweries instead of that giant thing is about it. It's a better thing. And I was Bush in St. Louis. But, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's hard to make money here. They do a good job. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, uh, uh, the help of the distillery industry, they lowered the bonding license from $10,000 to $1,000. Yes. Which right. is what started all the micro yeah. distilleries. Yeah. Yeah. Beer was the same. The A1 license used to be uh, five or six grand. Now it's uh, seven or fifty dollars a grand. So if you want to open a brewery, as long as you can get a license, it's seven or fifty bucks. Uh, there's a lot of great breweries all over the U.S. Every city's got their own breweries. It's really cool. Yeah. Now they're strapping the recovery of the American city on the artist's back and the brewer's back. Yeah. Yeah. And then why not? <laughs> <laughs> Those will be good cities. Here, sit down. We'll talk about Clipson. <laughs> You're going to put me on the show, won't you? <laughs> you I know what Tom does with these videos. <laughs> Nobody there. watches them. Nobody watches oh, them. I got 177 views on the pottery show. Mm -hmm. Pottery show. Yeah, I, I did. You know, I do a show for each, each show here. And 177, that's up there. It's just big time. I mean, as far as my. Uh, it's definitely more than zero. Yeah. You know, or yeah. one. No, I like this problem with you. You know, I've got, or maybe, maybe I've got 177 right. followers, which is, that's, you know, everyone is like, oh, I, I have no followers that are unpaid. <laughs> <laughs> that, that includes your, your wife and your kids. They, they don't really follow me. I think I follow them. <laughs> well, uh, I, I gave your daughter, Stella, at the market, an invitation for the golf outing. Oh, did you really? What you're saying is, uh, is Once he, again, the title sponsor. Is he the title sponsor? And so, uh, actually, I'm supposed to be uh, recruiting 
uh, sponsors. Uh, sponsors, you know, are prize right, winners. Right. I have to say something of mine. Right, right. Well, that, that's uh, the invitation I'm giving out to the employees. I'm trying to get three employees to, uh, to join, join me in the, in the foursome. Okay. Still, she go. I hope I do. Try to encourage her. She works there a lot. I know. I know, but good job for her. Try to encourage her. You know, it's hard to get everybody off the fence. It's a lot of fun. We're not going to really do much except drive around and take pictures. Attempt to and, hit golf balls. Yes, we'll be yeah. fine. And uh, I just want to take pictures of all the uh, coal sponsors. I just talked to Gerald Checko and a lot of people who have signed up to sponsor. Yeah. And there might be like two whole sponsors for each hole. Wow. And that many. Well, that's like 36. Well, I understand. I understand, but it's, it's, I think it's only 250 for the whole sponsor. 250 or 300. Uh, well, it's, but, but, you know, yeah. if you get two a whole, that's, that's some big money. Well, that's how we raise money. That's yeah. how we raise money. That's like, uh, what day is that again? August 27th. And I'll be a burning man. And also, uh, Gerald said that since the Women's Golf League is the benefactor. Oh, this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's all sure. those you see, people that support you see the uh, Women's Golf League. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, good. So all those people that are part of that group, yeah, they're going to be in on this too. You know, they have uh, had the uh, the Lady Bearcats have uh, been the um, Longest, not longest, forever, closest to the pin on a par three. Uh, you get to uh, wager against them. Yes, yeah, I wager. And uh, yeah, I wager too. I lose. <laughs> uh, I didn't put them last time. Oh, did you really? Oh, wow. I, I, I haven't even come close to like winning. Uh, <laughs> so they, uh, but yeah, they, they've been uh, they've been a part of the golf family actually almost every time. They're, they're very. They, it probably has been every year, hasn't it? That's so, and I think we're now in year seven. I've always been out of town. Or, or I don't know how that happened. Six or seven, or maybe even eight. Nine. Nine. Ninth year. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, okay. I didn't realize it's been that long. I remember when that thing got started. Yeah. I the wire kind of yeah, kicked it off. Then. And, uh, yeah, we, we used to refer to it as the Tom DeWire Memorial Outing, even though Tom's still with us. <laughs> Always thought that was kind of funny. Well, uh, I'll be, maybe I think I might drive the Clifton Market banner behind the golf cart. That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be there. I'm, we're going to have the threesome from the market. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'll talk to stuff. She, yeah, uh, please. I need somebody to sign up. You know, first come, first serve. So, but Chuck, now he's going to be at Burning Man. Chuck's going to Burning Man. It's the second time he's going. Really? Every time he goes, he comes back. He's twenty years younger. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, it's and, and it takes several days to get him to wear clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they Man. had a Burning Man exhibit. At, uh, oh right, the yeah. Exhibit. Exhibit. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. All this stuff was cleaned up and beautiful. Right. And right. Fly, and it's all covered with a layer of dust. Yeah. But that was interesting, though. I had never even heard of it until we saw that. Then we then we talked. We found out we knew people go there. So that's what I built that for the last time I was there. A 19 foot Da Vinci's flying machine. Oh my gosh! Took that's it incredible. Out there. It was so much fun. Yeah. Oh. And eventually, after the surviving, he flew it. Yeah, I flew it around the van while it was burning. Great, <laughs> great thermals. <laughs> so yeah, it turned out we knew someone that uh, has gone for many years and had no idea, but it was sort of like more of a, I think it's, uh, I, heard, I heard it's changed a little. You know, it's become a little less. Um, well, it's a big difference now. After two years, they they stopped all of with really rich people from just oh they have okay because that was that was uh, they had ten thousand dollars and and they get an art car yeah and, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know they get transportation and they get a gourmet chef they stop so yeah so that was when they did the uh, art piece exhibit that was uh some of the a little bit of controversy i think because it it's it, it, it had changed it had become like well that was before the pandemic yeah it, but it was like at the at the when it was starting to um, 2019, they were trying to start to 
throttle back. To throttle back and people. Because now like, you can't buy sell. Anything. You have, can't have any transaction on the part. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't pay anybody to do anything. Right. The the org, as they call it, yep. central people are the only people that are allowed to sell services right. on the fly. Yep, yep, yep. You can't you can't buy services. You can't pay anybody to you can't pay anybody to deliver your RV. Right. You can't pay right. anybody to cook for you. You can't pay right. So that the, changes the uh, the dynamic right. the way right. that if the rich rich guy well, we, we, Elon Musk wants to come, he's gonna have to cook his own food. Right, right. And drive his own car. The rest of the world operates or, that way. Or flying. You can still so, fly. So those big yacht, land yachts and gigantic uh, RVs are really technically would have to be like a mom and pop. They're just doing it. Man. Well, they have to drive, you have to drive in your own RV. You can't have somebody else drive in your RV and you fly in. Right. So you gotta be willing to pay to play. With time, so we'll see how it goes. Well, the one to my well, this, is, well, this is, more strict rules have come into play since. I mean, they stopped selling coffee at the at center camp. Yeah, but anyway, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, time is the ultimate commodity. That's the equalizing commodity because we all have, you know, not the same amount, but you know, relatively speaking, it's an equal amount of while we're together. So. Your time, if they use things that force people to use their personal time, like driving in, then they're just like everybody else. This is no substitute. Well, we'll see how it goes. Can you bring a hot air balloon in? I guess you could. You'd have to fly your own plane in. People do. Hot air balloons? I haven't seen any hot air balloons. Yeah. But, but uh, no, I'm in charge of, of driving around with fly in. Telling people not to leak gray water or oil on the fly up. Sure. For my volunteer with Earth Guardians Camp. Mm -hmm. And that's our job. We're actually part of the organization that runs the event. Hmm. Wow, it sounds like Clifton Fest. <laughs> but they do have times 100,000. I got caught. Are you supposed to ask me uh, riveting questions, Tom, or just this is your story? Well, uh, <laughs> you talk about a CAC no. opening. Is yes. there a Clifton Fest? I've heard there will not be. Okay, well, that's new. And, and, and I thought they uh, even uh, kind of shut down the LLC that was. Why, why no Clifton Fest? There was one last year, wasn't it? No. no. It hadn't been for two. And I think it was that. And then I think the people that were running it, you know, they. they I've been doing out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Ready for break. Absolutely. Um, it's right. time to change the I run our day. You know, we did it to this year for the first time in two years. It's it's pretty green. Sorry. Okay. I'm getting messages from my loved ones. So you have to be home, right? No, nope, not yet. They're stopping at Target. But but soon. Soon on. Well, I'm in charge of, of the Contemporary Arts Center trying to get them off of, trying to improve their energy efficiency by 50% by oh. 2030. And uh, are you helping them with the uh, building design at all, aren't you? You know, the new building? No, you're talking oh, about Contemporary Arts Center. Sorry, sorry. You're talking about the Zaha D building. Uh, okay, okay. So, oh, sorry. Um, I got a grant from from an arts institute. This is downtown. Yeah, to help help pay for an analysis, energy analysis yeah. of the building, and I'm starting to learn that you will have to completely retrofit the HVAC system too, like a Mitsubishi, uh, like these these guys, heat exchangers. This is yeah, this yeah. is the wave of the future. It runs on electricity. The electricity can be renewable. And, and they really work well. They're extremely efficient. So they have a, do they have coolant lines? There? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this, this, this can be cooling or heating. All the time. So on instead, of, instead of ducting, it, it supplies the, basically the temperature or the cool, cool or heated. But it has to be on the outside. Fluid. Well, there's a, there's a condenser. 
No, it doesn't. No, no, that's just there. These don't have to be. They, the condenser can be somewhere else. Where is it? Well, it, it, the, the, the fins or something is outside, mm -hmm. and, it, and it pumps the hot or cold water or fluid into yeah. these units. And I mean, they're, they're, so the CAC is going to have to switch over from a boiler and chilled water to something like this. Yeah. And, and we might as well just go ahead and build a, a solar farm. So oh, I'm going to try yeah. to work with sure. like the uh, Freedom Center and the CAC and the Taft Museum or the Art Museum to go and build a solar farm like the city of Cincinnati has done. So it's, it's the whole scope of the project is it's gotten. Is the, uh, is the original architect of the building still alive? No, it's all high passed away in 2010, I think. Okay. I wasn't quite sure because when you when you go to do stuff like this, I, I think it would always be great to consult with the person who designed the building. Well, we, we tried. Gaskin is in charge of her architectural firm. Okay, I mean he's all in favor of, of trying to go carbon neutral. Yeah, but uh, interesting. It's really well. You want whatever you do, you want it to be you know to preserve the quality of the building. Yeah, we won't really not change not the building. And yeah, I mean we we have the air air movement system installed in the building. It's just that currently the building um, sends in really cold air to keep the humidity down, and yeah. then heats it up from a boiler of hot water at at the at the at the, at the, at the oh, vent. Oh, really? Okay. It's called a VAV reheat, and. Yeah. Uh, it's very inefficient. Right, sure, because you, you're cooling it, then heating, heating it. So you're you're burning the candle right, both ends right, right. all year round. Yeah. So it's and the cooling is done to remove the humidity out of there. So it's not like right. a highly humid air. Right. Interesting. Wow. But this whole back when energy didn't matter, you could do stuff like that. That's true. Grass was <laughs> based yeah. on really when that right house was built, you know. It was the heating bill was thirty dollars a month, right? Well, it's a big project that you've taken on the help of that the CAC, and the, looks like it's moving ahead. You got, got a grant to do the, the professional engineering study, but I'm I'm learning that. Look at guys, I want to. You, it's obvious what the problem is with the building. I've, I've got all the energy records for the last three years. I can answer any questions. There's no low hanging fruit. Right. The, right. the, the, the HVAC system in the building is just it's very common knowledge that it's, it, it's not, it's the problem. It's not going to solve. We can't install like an energy and cooling recovery right. unit on the roof because that's, that's, not going to reach our goal of, of reducing our energy use 50 percent by 2030. Sure, sure. So we have to make a drastic change, and uh, it's been cool. It's been cool because they got I got a grant. I'm talking to engineering firms. They're talking to me because I got money. You know, and you got salaries and other stuff. No, I'm, I'm just putting out bids to everybody in town, and uh, some of them will. Commit to it. Some of them, some of them would like to just take the whole responsibility of the project, and and from from creation, design to management after the, after the building is right. installed. So that's that's uh, that's good. I mean, yeah, to implement your recommendations sounds like a good idea. It's ambitious, <laughs> but we're going to have to. I'm excited that we're going to have to try to install another solar farm like City of Cincinnati did. They did it. They they jumped through all the hurdles, and, yeah. and I think it would be, you know, it's a, this is a global publicity approach. The Zaha building is recognizably the, besides the Crew Tower or 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 the um, Terrace Plaza. You know, this is the most significant architectural in, in Cincinnati. Well, the first concrete, eleven-story building, also yeah, is significant. And the Roebling Bridge, 
He's, he's right up there. Yeah. yeah. Roman <laughs> couldn't get financing from either Kentucky or Cincinnati, so he put the bridge in between the blocks, the main <laughs> blocks. Yeah, and charged the toll. They probably made a lot of money off that bridge. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, it was it was a struggle. Uh, sure. Well, what else is coming up? We have a very important uh, event called the uh, Clifton Has Talent event. That is next week. You said at the pool? It's at the pool. At the Clifton Pool. The various talented people at Clifton will show up and uh, next week and parlay their talents. Dang, I'm going to be. Yeah. Is that Sunday night? Nope, Saturday. Yeah, I'm going to be on the fire, fire talents. Uh, fire, you know, it, there is really no uh, clear description of what talents may be brought. I would assume if, if you uh, are a fire talent person. Well, we had some fire talent at the last Clifton Fest. Uh, oh, really? Okay, we, yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I videotaped it. It was probably four years ago. Normally, it's usually musical, but right. I'm going to I'm gonna throw a little poetry in this time. Do you want to play the guitar and give us a little taste of it? <laughs> Um, I don't know. Well, I gotta check my. Let me check the, the time real quick. Let's see. Yeah. I really like your guys' shirts. They, they seem so modern. It's kind of the flaps. And... Oh, this is a. This is one of these great uh, um, resale. Not even resale. This was bought. Yeah. You know, one of those places where they sell clothes by the pound <laughs> or, the, or the kilogram or whatever. Well, this is Patagonia Warren here. So this is somebody else's clothes. Yeah, think. this is someone else's clothes also. That's wow. how I get most of my clothes. Is wow. I'm buying them for people that have already bought them. <laughs> they're better. They're more affordable that way. That's what I think. <laughs> far, far more affordable. All right. I, I think I can, I, I can take a little, but uh, yeah. yeah. The talent show cometh. That's a big yeah, nice show. This is a, I love this piece here. This is this is cooking. This, this is Mark Pratfall's piece. He's the curator for the show. Mark Pratfall is a big part of uh, Place Big Press. That's not the place Press. Place Place Big Press. All right, Jets. I got to run here. Thanks for playing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you Quite for free. allowing me to be a guest on the show. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>